All right. Uh, any other news before we dive into the the episode here, Jimmy? No, I don't think so. I think it's uh, I think it's finally time to tackle the Night of the Laughing Tree. OK, well, let's dive in here. So, again, this is a part two of where we were at before. And this is really going to be kind of like a dive into Howland Reed. So with the last time we talked, we talked about everything that took place essentially before Mira tells this story about a knight, the, the chronic man. Right. So mm -hmm. that's where things get really kind of interesting here. So they it all it all kind of starts because Hodor says Hodor and then Bran says, well, that's not Hodor's name. And then he talks about old Nan a little bit and he's like, well, old Nan wasn't her name. And then it says, you know, they talk about like, well, old Nan has stories. And so, you know, do you know any stories? He asked the reeds all of a sudden. Mira laughed. Oh, a few. A few, her brother admitted. Uh, and, if you know, the funny thing about that is like a few, her brother admitted, like, we don't really know exactly because you're reading it, the, the the framing around that, she might know a lot more, she might just know a few, like it's kind of one of those things that's hard to pick up exactly because you're reading it as text and yeah. it doesn't really get, get placed in the show, so we don't really get to see the context of it and you could, it's really hard to trust anything that uh, Roy Detrice says as the audio <laughs> yeah, he, he is not, uh, yeah. because he's, he's not, he's not a reliable source for even things that, you know, where tone is something you have, as how you would hear it, so um, you could tell one, said Bran, while we walked. Hodor likes stories about knights. I do, too. There are no knights in the neck, said Jojen. Above the water, her sister corrected. The bogs are, are full of dead ones, though. That's true. Andals and Ironmen, Freys and other fools, all those proud warriors who set out to conquer Greywater, not one of them could find it. They rode into the neck and not back out. So here we go. So, um... As we go in here, there was one night, said Mira, in the year of the false spring, the night of the laughing tree, they called him. He might have been a chronic man, that one, or not. Jojen's face was dappled with green shadows. Prince Bran has heard that tale a hundred times, I'm sure. No, said Bran, I haven't. And if I have, it doesn't matter. Sometimes old Nan would tell me the same story she told me before, but we never mind it. It's... Uh, if it was a good story, if it was a good story, old stories are like old friends, she used to say. You have to visit them from time to time. Now, that line, I want to pause great, there. Right great, great line. Is a great line just as as itself about stories. Old stories are like old friends, she used to say. You have to visit them from time to time. As a, Just as a line, that's a, that's a great line about stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much context in the last paragraph, it's like insane. So for starters, there was one night, said Mira, in the year of the fall spring, right? She says he might have been a chronic man that one. This is where things start to get interesting because the story she's about to tell us is so obviously the story of Howland Reed, but she never refers to him as Howland Reed like her father. And then they then they assume that Bran has heard this story. So the que the whole question about this entire story is, does she know this is her dad or is this a story she's been told? And I mean, what, what do you think, Jimmy? So I think she's going about this in a very much, this is a tale type of way and not mentioning that it's her father and wanting to see what Ned has told Bran. I think, I think Mira uh, and Jojen know about Jon sure. Snow. I think that they don't want to mess up by giving him information they weren't supposed to, to disclose to him at this point. And I think that they're trying to kind of feel around for it. And maybe, maybe they're telling it in this manner just to see if Bran picks up on certain things. But yeah, I think Mira knows that this is her father. I do. Yeah. So, okay. So that the, I, I agree with you on that. I also love that it says Jojen's face was drappled, was dappled with green shadows. You know what I mean? It's just like, as the story is beginning to go on, yeah, and Jojen's the one who also says, or not, as if he knows that Bran doesn't know this story. And then it specifically says with green shadows, like in, you know, yeah, green and also, shadows and, specifically. And also the the uh, chronic man, right? Green, Jojen green. It's kind of like a hint, like, hey, it's their dad. Yeah. Yeah. Or no. Uh, so I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, excuse me. I'm sorry. So he might have heard that one. The way it, it's on the page is, is so it's actually Mira. Oh, no, hold on. Who is it that actually says that? Because 
Prince Bran has heard that tale a hundred times. So it's Jojen who says Prince Bran has heard the tale a hundred times. It's Mira who says or not. It's just the way it's on the page. Um, it actually looks. So yeah. Anyway, so then Bran says, no, I haven't. And then Bran is actually the one who says the thing about old Nan. You know, old, you have to visit them from time to time, which we know Ned Stark has not visited Hal and Reed, which is kind of like the ironic, you know, funny thing mm -hmm. about about this whole thing. But that's a great way for George as the author to display it to us to set us up for this entire story of Mira thinks Bran's heard it. Jojen says or Mira doesn't think Bran's heard it. Jojen says, I think he has. And then because later Jojen asks him, he's like, are you sure your dad's never told you that story? And then here you have Bran saying this thing about old Nan, again, setting this story up. So, mm -hmm. so that's true. Mira walked with her shield on her backpack, pushing an occasional branch out of the way with her frog spear. Just when Bran began to think that she wasn't going to tell the story, she began. Once there was a curious lad who lived in the neck. He was small like all chronic men, but brave and smart and strong as well. He grew up hunting and fishing and climbing trees and learned all the magics of my people. So there, again, it's also like she's already saying, like, we have magic. Right? Mm -hmm. and all the magics of my people. So all my people have these magic. Now, some of this stuff is like when they refer to like chronic man magic, I would imagine what they're talking about is like using the frog spear, maybe understanding like how swamps work and I don't know, like water currents, perhaps, I don't know. Cause I, they never really dive super deep into what exactly like chronic man magic is compared to other things. Yeah, but I would imagine it's some kind of thing to do with like green dreams and maybe some, you know, I mean, like Blood Raven uses like a sorcerer and uses like glamoring and things like that. So perhaps they know some like, you know, medicine by using this plant and they never go into it. Yeah, I think it's also good context to keep in mind that this is a story that has been passed down since this event and that. Uh, like all stories, things get added in. It gets kind of uh, embellished a little bit, and we have to keep keep our you know mind about us whenever we're listening to the story. Because, like, I think it, you're right. I think the magic is probably more of like knowing the land, right? Knowing when the fog right. rolls in and where you can walk and where you can't, and all of that. So that's that's my guess, but who knows? Maybe there is some magic over there in the swamps. <laughs> So Bran specifically asks her and he says, did he have green dreams like Jojen? No, said Mira, but he could breathe mud and run on leaves and change earth to water and water to earth with no more than a whispered word. He could talk to trees and weave words and make castles appear and disappear. So some of that, I think, also could just be like he knows the lay of the land mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean. When you Some think embellishments. Of like, yeah, it, exactly. Like breathe mud. I think it's like, okay, he knows how to like walk, you know, like swim through mud where it's not, you're not going to sink, you know, stuff like that. Um, but she does, he does specifically says, does he have green dreams? And she said, no. Which then makes you wonder why Jojen would have green dreams. Like what? And, and, and she's talking about the magic of my people. So the kind of funny thing about the, or I guess the interesting thing about he could talk to trees and weave words is because when we hear about like the children of the forest and some, you know, originally back in like the world of ice and fire, when they talk about that, when they talk about the, the sound that they made sounds like leaves rustling and like the wind. And it sounds like nature essentially. And that's kind of what's being said here. Mm -hmm. So Bran says, I wish I could. Uh, you know, which we know he's going to be able to talk to trees. So when did he meet the tree knight? Mira made a face at him so, uh, sooner if a certain prince will be quiet. You know, the, la the lad knew the magics of the chronic, she continued, continued, but he wanted more. Our people seldom travel far from home, you know. We're a small folk and our ways seem queer to some. So the big people do not always treat us kindly. But this lad was bolder than most. And one day when he had grown to manhood, he decided he would leave the Chronogs and visit the Isle of Faces. No one visits the Isle of Faces, objected Bran. That's where the green men live. If the, It was the green men he meant to find. So he donned a shirt sewn with bronze scales like mine, took up a leathern shield and a three-pronged spear like mine, and paddled a light-skinned boat down the green fork. Bran closed his eyes and he's trying to imagine this 
In his head, the chronic man looked like jo Jojen, only older and stronger and dressed like Mira. He passed beneath the twins by night, so the phrase would not attack him. And when he reached the trident, he climbed from the river and put his boat on his head and began to walk. It took him many a day, but he finally reached the god's eye, threw his boat in the lake, and paddled out to the Isle of Faces. Did he meet the green men? Yes, said Mira. But that's another story and not for me to tell. Makes you feel like there's someone who is going to tell that story, and that story just might be uh, Helen Reed. Exactly. Now, <laughs> the funny thing, and we'll get to it all here in a bit, is everything so the way this story begins is that howland reed is like one of the most powerful chronic men magic users he's bold he's adventurous he wants more than he already has but the story we're sort of presented in other times about howland reed is everything that happens at the turning night uh, the you know the turning at heron hall is because he's like weak and he gets beat up by these squires well, and yeah. it's he, he can be brave, but also frail, right? Like, and that, that maybe that's what makes him brave is the fact that his people are so much smaller and they're kind of usually isolated to their area, but he is the one to kind of take that step out. Like it's almost a fantasy story on its own of like, you know, the great adventure type deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it almost reminds you of hobbits a little bit. Does it not little guy leaving a little his bit? Town, yeah. Getting smacked around a little bit. I mean, I think that that's pr fairly uh, common in fantasy stories. So, Maybe bit off a little bit more he could chew, and that's why he ended up getting smacked at uh, the tourney at Heron Hall. Yeah. Um, let me see here. I just want to see because they're about to say they're about to talk about a winter, and so we don't know exactly how long this lasted. But it's believed. I mean, it seemed like this winter lasted at least like almost a year. Um, so, because the next thing that's said, one second here, is, so he's there. He goes to the Isle of Faces. All that winter, the Chronicman stayed on the Isle, but when the spring broke, he heard the wide world calling and knew the time had come to leave. Which, how does, he hears the world calling? Like, it's not like he hears, like, they say trumpets or something because there's an attorney next door. Just says the world is calling him. Um, Maybe that world is... uh brand who knows that's a that's a great point so he says his farewells and paddled off towards shore he rode and rode and finally saw distant towers of a castle riding beside the lake you know we know that's going to be heron hall you know mira smiled was it you know so that that right there too the was it like lets you know she knows more about the story and she knows like where it's going and she's mm -hmm. presenting it to brand so he gets there and you know they start talking about a lot. there's Great smelling meats and laughter and attorney. The king is there with his son, the dragon prince. The white swords had come as well uh, to welcome a new brother in their ranks. The storm lord was on hand and the rose lord as well. The great lion that continues. The chronic man had never seen such pageantry and he knew he might never see the like again. Part of him wanted nothing to do, nothing to be part of it. Brand knew that feeling what that. Bran knew that feeling well enough when he'd been little, all he'd ever dreamed of was being a knight, but he had, but that had been before he lost his legs. The daughter of the great castle reigned as queen of love and beauty when the tourney opened. Five champions had sworn to defend her crown for her four brothers of Harrenhal and her famous uncle, a white knight of the Kingsguard. Um, you know, she says, was she a fair maid? Yes, but there were others fairer still. One was the wife of the dragon prince who brought a dozen lady companions to attend her. The knights all begged them for her favors about, you know, to tie about their lances. This isn't going to be one of those love stories, is it? Uh, you know, Brand asks and then Hodor says, Hodor, agreeably. Um, he likes the stories where knights fight monsters, too, which is also a, a great line about, about Hodor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the knights are the monsters, Brand, which is a great come back to so good <laughs> so good for so many reasons as we get to the little chronic man was walking across the field enjoying the warm spring day and harming none when he was set upon by three squires they were none older than 15 yet even so they were bigger than him all three this was their world as they saw it, and he had no right to be there they snatched away his spear knocked him to the ground cursing him for a frog eater 
Uh, were they Walders? You know, it sounds like something that the Walders would have done. None offered a name, but he marked their faces. And so he could have revenge upon them later. They shoved him down. Every time he tried to rise, he got knocked down again. Then they heard a roar. That's my father's man. You're kicking. How to the she-wolf. A wolf on four legs or two. Two. The she-wolf laid into the squires with attorney swords, scattering them all. The chronic man was bruised and bloodied, so she took him back to her lair to clean his cuts and bind them up with linen. There he met her pack brothers, the wild wolf who led them, the quiet wolf beside them, and the pup who was the youngest of the four. That evening, there was meant to be a feast in Heron Hall to mark the opening of the tourney, and the she-wolf insisted that the lad attend. He was of high uh, of high birth, which has as much right to a place in the bench as any other. She was not easy to refuse this wolf maid, so he let the youngest pup find him garb suitable for a king's feast, um, and they went to the great castle. They ate under the roof. You know, they continue on a little bit here, too. They talk about some of the other people that are moose, bears, mermen. The dragon prince sang a song so sad it made the wolf maid sniffle, but when her pup brothers teased her for crying, she poured wine over his head. A black brother spoke asking for knights to join for people to join the night's watch. The storm Lord drinks <clears throat> a night of skulls and kisses the, uh, in a, a wine cup war. The chronic men saw a maid with laughing purple eyes dance with a white sword, a red snake and the Lord of Griffins. And lastly with the quiet wolf, but only after the wild wolf spoke to her on her behalf of a brother too shy to leave his bench. Um, you know, this, kind of continues on a little bit here um the, you know the phrase are there uh, and brand saying oh i know that i know those those sigils the wolf maid saw them too and pointed them out to her brothers i could find you a horse and some armor that might fit the pup offered the little chronic man thanked him but gave no answer his heart was torn chronic men are smaller than most but just as proud the lad was no knight and no, uh, no more than any of his people we sit a boat more often than a horse and our hands are made for oars not lances much as he wished to have his vengeance, he feared he would only make a fool of himself and shame his people. Uh, the quiet wolf offers something, you know, a place to stay that night. And it sort of continues on. And as they're, re as they're reading, you know, it says he, uh, but before he slept, he looked across the water to where the Isle of Faces would be and said a prayer to the old gods of North and Neck. And as he's, as this is being presented, so this is important. As she's saying, oh, the prayer to the gods of the north and neck, Jojen immediately interrupts and says, you never heard this tale from your father. And he says it was old Nan who told the stories. Um, and so then, you know, Hodor and all this stuff. And then so like, what do you think about that, too? That Jojen like specifically interrupts at that point about the gods. Hmm. Anything from it? Or is that just or is that just Jojen interrupting? I say I just took it for Jojen interrupting. Um, but I'm just wondering. So, so the, 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 there's a couple different things, right? So I think Jojen is surprised that Edard Stark has not told Bran this. And this is what they were kind of trying to verify with keeping the story kind of like a tale. And also possibly was waiting for maybe the fact that Edard did not tell Bran this exact story, but pieces of, of a bigger story and that Bran would start putting it together. But Bran is taking it just as a story. So I, I I think that's part of it. But then I think about Bran and his powers that he's going to have from Werewood and Blood Raven. And maybe that's linked to the gods. Maybe that is the old guy. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe <laughs> Jojen sitting there with a lot of foresight saying, Bran, we're talking like you're the gods. Yeah. So we've heard that knights might be monsters. Right. I mean, there's a there's a line, but sometimes the knights are the monsters. So like it's almost like be above them. And we're hearing about chronic men magic. Like there's so many elements to this outside of just the story, which I think is what, you know, on, on a first and second, even third time read. I mean, this is like the fifth time I'm probably reading this and I still feel like I'm learning something new every time. You know, it's because the first time you read it, you're like, oh, you're just hearing the story. OK, like, oh, it's mm -hmm. the she wolf and all that stuff catches you off guard. And the second time I went back and I, the thing that surprised me the most of like, just when I'm reading this, like in general, not like specifically for today's episode, my big focus is on Howland because it was so, so much of it just didn't like add up to me. I was like, how is somebody who is capable of going to the Isle of Faces, which like nobody does 
and he does, and he's described as having all this chronic man magic and everything. How does he actually get bullied by three squires? Like, does he purposely get bullied by three squires so that the wolves can come aid him and set well, this entire thing off? That is <clears throat> possible. And I mean, if you want to get if you want to get real tinfoil theory here. You know, we've talked about like bootstrap theories and time theories. What's to say Bran didn't talk to him through the trees? You oh. know, I, I, I still love the idea that we could be living inside of a like alternate, like this entire story could be set inside because the show is for the show to work. You are already inside of an alternate universe in which Bran has influenced the past. Yes. Without a doubt. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 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 You're, you're already in a different timeline, but I, so I do think it's possible that the he, listening to the world, he went to Heron hall could absolutely, especially the faces, right? That Bran or hoop blood Raven, whoever could have kickstarted this thing off. I will also say it's likely that he got beat up by three squires because his power is in the environment mm -hmm. of the net uh, of the swamps, right? And that's where his magic comes from. It makes it an even battlefield for him because he knows how to maneuver. So when he's outside of that at Heron Hall in a in a normal fight uh, with with squires that maybe three of them, you know, could beat him down. And he did keep trying to get up. I mean, it takes a lot of wherewithal to be able to get back to your feet. But it's more interesting that there's a two footed wolf who we know to be Lyanna Stark. Yeah. Uh, another another small detail here I want to point out. So as as it's kind of continuing, Jojen interrupts them. Uh, you know, she goes on to talk about their five days of jousting. There was a great melee, and she starts going on about there's a horse race and some of these other things. And as she's doing it, Brand's like, "Never mind about that. Tell me about the jousting." So there was a piece to this story that gets cut off because Brand's like, "I don't care about the rest." Stupid that Brand. Mira, that Mira obviously wants to tell him, and like the importance of her telling this story, she has a specific way of which she wants to do it. You know, the other thing about the gods, too, about like, oh, he prayed yeah. to these gods and these guys. And Jojen's like, yeah, get rid of that. Maybe because Jojen is being influenced by the three eyed crow and the three eyed crow is like, no, I don't think so. Maybe not. Maybe that's like super reading into into I it. Think, I think it's fun to think about. But it's just very interesting that Jojen specifically interrupts. I mean, Jojen certainly has been influenced by the three eyed crow. So his perception of gods and other things may be totally different. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're like have a certain when you're a certain even when you have like a certain political belief in our world, you know, sometimes you'll be at like Thanksgiving and you could start to hear something going a certain path that you may or may not agree with. And you're like, ah, I'm just going to kind of maybe try to redirect this so we don't get into like a big fight over, you know, politics, or like whichever side you're, you're on. You know what I mean? Like we've all been there before where. You know, you start to hear something about, well, it's what you voted for. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, let's go. You, know I mean? you know what I mean? Who wants the pumpkin pie? In. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. In other news, you know, like something like that, like it doesn't it doesn't mean that like the three eyed crow was like influencing him in that moment, but certainly. So that's just kind of interesting that Mira wants to tell this a certain way, and then it gets cut a few times. Because it seems like she has an objective with this story. Yeah. And uh, it's also probably George being like, you think you're going to get a bunch sure. of answers right here and I am not ready to give them to you. Uh, I think so. It's all there's also that part of it where George is kind of toying with us a little bit. Very frustrating because uh, Bran could have easily let them just tell the damn story. But it just shows you Thank like, Georgian. yeah, Bran just doesn't have any idea of what he's in for at all he's he's still a kid yeah he is but he's learning also there is a story for another time too that's also in this that's like what you know uh, what i mean like, right now yeah exactly um so it uh it continues on a, a little bit here too where she's saying you know talk about the jousting and stuff like that um and she starts to get into it right the daughter of the castle was the queen of love and beauty her four brothers you know um some of the stuff you know we already know 
Uh, but really, it's the second day where things get a little interesting when a mystery knight appears from the list. Mystery knights, you'd often appear at tourneys. They talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, the dragon knight once wore a tourney. Appeared as Mystery Knight, we know. Brand says it was the Chronic Man, I bet. No one knew, said Mira. But the Mystery Knight was short of stature and clad in ill fitting armor made up of bits and pieces. The device upon his shield was a heart tree of the old gods, a white weirwood with a laughing red face. Maybe it came from the Isle of Faces, said Bran. Was he green? In Old Nan's stories, the Guardians had dark green skin and leaves instead of hair, which. It's like the children of the forest, but that's kind of interesting too. The guardians of the Isle of Faces. Yeah. Like that's the only time we ever hear about that, like specifically. Yeah. Do these differ from the other children of the forest? Exactly. And like the green men, like, cause the, the children of the forest that we meet are like female, I guess, you know, cause it's like a leaf. It, she may not be like, you know, the way it works for them. We, we don't know, but it's like, obviously yeah. the way she's, she's presented as a, as of like a female, they may have male and female ones. It may just be whatever. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, so the green men could just be green from the forest too. Uh, you know, so maybe they're male version. We don't know. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, continues on. It says some, uh, sometimes they had antlers too, but brand didn't see how, it, how the mystery knight could have worn a helmet if he had antlers, which is funny because, you know, Robert Baratheon's helmet does have antlers on it. I mean, of course, it's a helmet, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, I bet the old gods sent him. Perhaps they did. The mystery knight dipped his lance before the king and rode to the end of the list where the five champions had their uh, pavilions. You know, the three that challenged, you know, the, the, they talk about that. You know, he brand says he was a little chronic man. I told you. Whoever he was, the old gods gave strength to his arm. The porcupine knight fell first, then the pitchfork knight, then lastly, the knight of the two towers. None were well loved, so the common folk cheered for the knight of the laughing tree, as the new champion soon was called. When his fallen foes sought to ransom horse and armor, the knight of the laughing tree spoke in a booming voice through his helm, saying, teacher squires answer, that shall be ransom enough. Once the defeated knights chastised their squires, you know, the horses and armors were returned. And so the little chronicsman prayer was answered by the green man, by the green men or the old gods or the children of the forest who can say, we talked about that a little bit last time that <clears throat> remember, maybe she was going to say the children of the forest too, before Jojen interrupted her, like the old gods or the gods of the neck or the, but Brandon or, or but Jojen interrupts her. Here, it's always the old gods or the new gods, but here it's the green men or the old gods or the children of the forest. So it just kind of shows you the way that Mira, or at least the story being presented, if Mira is telling this verbatim how she's learned it from Howland and her mother, or if she's embellishing here and she's displaying it in the way she wants it to be presented, which feels like it might be slightly different than Jojen, interesting yeah yeah you wonder if all these things are the same thing or if or if they really are different and separate entities yeah hmm. uh, we'll continue we'll continue on here is because it, it's almost over um so then we know you know that uh the the next thing that happened is the night of the van, van, van the night of the lashing tree vanishes and the king is upset because the king thinks they were mocking was you know sent to mocking him um the king was was wroth and even sent his son, the dragon prince, to seek the man. But all they ever found was his painted shield hanging abandoned in a tree. It was the dragon prince that won the tourney in the end. Bran says, oh, that was a good story. But it should have been three bad knights who hurt him, not their squires. Then the little chronic man could have killed them all. And so like Bran is saying, you know, like, I didn't like this part of the story. I didn't like this part. <laughs> As if it's like a, ma a completely made up story. As yeah. If, like, it... the, story, the story is complete fiction. Yeah, and on your first read through, if you're just kind of cruising through, you could probably be with Bran and be like, "Mirror than them telling stories." But like, you know, if you have any wherewithal at all, you you know that something's being relayed to us here through the story. Exactly, so, dude. Yeah, d <laughs> it, real, real quick here, because so he goes on. He says, you know, um, all the mystery knights should and the mystery knight should win the tourney, defeating every challenger and name the wolf maid, the queen of love and beauty. She was said Mira, but that's a sadder story, which 
which feels different from the other story of like Halland, you know, so like, oh, there's a so like there's two more stories to really learn from this whole thing. Are Do you, you think we'll get those stories from Mira? Yes. Uh, from Mira, maybe not, but certainly we will get them. I mean, okay. we sort of know, we sort of get some of the other stories. Um, so Jojen asks again real quick here. Are you certain you've never heard this tale before, Bran? Asked Jojen. Your, your Lord Father never told it to you. Bran shakes his head, you know, and then and it just, you know, the day was growing old and the shadows were creeping down. Um, if the little chronic men could visit the Isle of Faces, maybe I could too. All the tales agreed that the green men had strange magic powers. Maybe they could help him walk again, even turn him into a knight. They turned the little chronic man into a knight, even if it was only for a day, he thought a day would be enough. Hmm. Makes you feel like the Isle of Faces is going to be like a big thing towards the end of the series. Yeah. You know what I, you know, when I was first, when I was reading, even watching Game of Thrones for the first time, because I think I watched like seasons, I watched like the first few seasons and then I like started reading what I, what I thought was going to happen was <laughs> after Ned Stark got killed, I was like, okay, this is all going to come down to like Joffrey versus Bran. And it's going to be like Bran with like magic like powers letting him walk again and it's that's going to be like the final battle is like joffrey verse <laughs> that's seriously what i thought i thought I, I, that's, you know when i was well, reading it with, without any context of like you know seasons four you know seasons four five yeah. six and seven and like without having read you know a storm of swords and a feast for crows and a dance of dragons that's where i that's totally where i thought the whole thing was going to go well george's original outline and rob stark kills joffrey in the field of battle so yeah back in the OG uh, outline. So you, you just had the wrong Stark and you would have been in line right. with his original idea, but it is kind of fun to think about like what you thought before getting all of the information influence. Right? Yeah. And in, influence yeah. influenced by the thing. So, yeah. So this whole chapter really, and again, you know, this is part two, obviously. So the whole chapter itself is really kind of two parts and they're both very interesting in their own right. But obviously the, the big breakdown is the second part, which is the night of the laughing tree and the turning at Harrenhal story. So again, as we've been talking, some of the big breakdowns from this Mira specifically calls this person, the chronic man. We, you know, obviously can assume that it's Helen Reed. And then we hear about the other wolves, right? The quiet one, the shy one mm -hmm. who we know. Um, we don't know who the La night of the laughing tree is still uh to the to this point uh, the two big theories are that the night of the laughing tree is uh, howland reed or the night of the laughing tree was actually liana stark who i actually that's i do not think it was howland reed that was no no it, it, it's it has to be uh liana uh in, in right. my opinion so the reason why i think that is because this is the perfect opportunity for rhaegar and liana to meet prior to her getting you know the honor of being uh, the, the maid of honor or whatever it's called. I, I'm forgetting right now, but um, th this sets up that meeting that is so important to the entire series in the, in the baseline of the story. So it, it isn't just some random happenstance where Lyanna Stark is sitting there and then Rhaegar gives her this thing because to everyone else, this is the first time they've interacted that we know of. Right. Mm -hmm. And it just seems mm -hmm. like Rhaegar has done this thing where he kind of dishonors his wife, Ilya, and has essentially elevated a stark and everyone's like why would he do that and then people just assume uh liana stark would go along with this which does feed into the the perception or the viewpoint that rhaegar kidnaps her rapes her all these terrible things but what they don't know and what we do know i would say from this story is that most likely liana stark went night of the laughing tree did this thing and then ends up meeting Rhaegar whenever she's helping Helen Reed, right? So there's a whole relationship start that everyone else doesn't have. So it, it's just really important context, I think, for the entire series story. And the people who think that is not Lyanna Stark usually remark about the booming voices, uh, the booming voice and could a 14-year-old girl, uh, I think she's 14 or 15, I think, could she really dethrone some knights? But First off, we have to remember that George has 14 and 13 year olds doing crazy things, some inappropriate, uh, and this is a fantasy world. So in this universe, yes, it could happen. And the booming voice is most likely just from uh, the helmet, right? The helmet can make it a booming loudly. 
uh, doesn't mean that the voice was super duper deep. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm of the opinion that Lyanna Stark is definitely this. Also, we see Bran have a vision of her beating Benjen like pretty bad with the practice swords. So we know that Lyanna was martially gifted and also Arya is kind of a mirror to her as well. So for me, there's no one else it could be than Lyanna Stark. I actually don't, the only other person that could possibly be like Benjen but I don't really think that that's that compelling. I don't think it helps the story all that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just want to, I'm just pulling something up here real quick here. Um, because something that did way back uh, in the day was a mega four part tourney at Heron Hall thing on patreon mm -hmm. and jimmy and i jimmy and i've talked about actually redoing this because you and i haven't done it and it's yeah. by a it is by a reddit user somebody who's written like a ton of stuff it's i think it's cantus is how it's pronounced i've even heard him i've even watched a video of him saying or it's like can't use like it's, whatever it doesn't matter anyway has this mega like almost like manifesto level theory written about the uh Turning of Heron Hall and like everything that happens and it goes in a really different direction than I think I've sort of ever thought about it or at least I initially ever thought about it in that the way he writes it is that it's not necessarily that Rhaegar was like he like may meet Lyanna but maybe he doesn't like initially sort of fall like in love with her and he's like oh um Song of Ice and Fire and all this stuff like like because some of the arguments about the tourney at Heron Hall is does Rhaegar go in knowing he's going to crown Lyanna Stark queen of love and beauty because it's ice and fire and she's the one and all these things, or do things just happen to go that way? And he gets into it. And what he ultimately argues is that part of the reason Rhaegar kidnaps Lyanna Stark is because of the things that happened to like the Nightly laughing tree and that the mad King may begin to find out that that's who it was and she is remember she's like at like i think like the end of the crossroads or something like she's she's not in winterfell when she's abducted and so it's like really he goes to backpedal because all of the things about heron hall are that Rhaegar is actually like secretly trying to set up all of these alliances to overthrow his dad so there's like the mystical element of Howland Reed being there. And did he know about it by going to the Isle of Faces? When he hears the world call, he decides I have to go to this tourney, right? And he gets there and it sets up this huge chain of events that influences the other big political thing that was already happening. So like, I mean, Heron Hall is like the whole deal. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the root it's of like the whole story. The whole, the whole deal is because of Heron Hall. <laughs> Yeah, and this is, you know, why George is supposedly writing a Broadway play, <laughs> whether we ever see it uh, remains to be seen. But I, I think another thing is, is like if Helen Reed is aware. So the, my idea is that she cleans up Helen Reed, becomes an idol tree. Rhaegar it, at that moment meets her. Right. And mm -hmm. Rhaegar said he has a moment where he's like, oh, this is it. I don't think he went in going, Lyanna Stark's going to be there. I'm going to do this. I think it was probably in the moment. In the prophecy, we think he was reading Aegon's prophecy, probably, and why he requested that he had to be a warrior or whatever. So I think it's in the moment. And I also think Helen Reed, knowing that he was the catalyst for those two to meet, is really important to Helen Reed's actions, or I should say inactions in the series. Because remember, Helen Reed does not come to Winterfell when he's requested by Ned. Everyone came except for Helen Reed. Um, Helen Reed also never came whenever Bran requested him to come. So you have, you have to kind of reconcile these things. And I think it's that Helen Reed is most likely in mourning that all of this stuff happened, you know, with Liana and Rhaegar and Bo Bobby Baratheon getting on the, all of it happened because of him being beat down by the squires. And then obviously Liana saving him. They meet. That's where Rhaegar and her meet. And he kind of feels that weight. And that's why he's just like, I'm never getting involved again. That that, that that's kind of what I feel like. And maybe he but was he, a, he knew he was a but pawn. He, 
but he but he is involved enough to dispatch his children. See, a lot of people are like, you know, when you hear the Starks, like, don't go south. Like, you want nothing to do with the Lannisters. You want nothing to do with this. He disp- he dispatches two of his kids to be like, nope, you guys got to go. And like, I need you to go right now. So I don't know. He is kind of involved. Yeah, you know what he said. It's supposed to be that they're swearing fealty, but he actually sent them after Jojen revealed the green dream about uh, the winged wolf, the chained up uh, wolf, and how and stirred because of magic, right? Yeah, like he, he uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a really tough, tough thing. I just feel like Helen Reed is definitely maybe the catalyst of where Rhaegar and Lyanna met, and that's a night of laughing tree story for sure. Here's something about Hal and Reed that I've been thinking about for years. So do you remember whenever, and we'll get it to it, when Catelyn sends Edward's bones north and mm-hmm. they go missing at the neck? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've never thought what? about that. Now that, but, now that. But now that you're bringing it up, that's a good point. Yeah. Dude, at the neck, his best friend's bones goes missing. Who has all this like weird magic that we don't even know what it is dude i i think i know and people are gonna be like well that's crazy but there's literally a freaking zombie mountain running around that yeah yeah we, remember we are in a yeah. fantasy series right magic's coming right. back into the world but even then it's just like even if it's not helen reed where are ned's bones that is not just gonna yeah. they no, didn't just gonna, go whoopsie no yeah it's 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 gonna be a thing now do you i mean some of the like the ned is like wargs into a raven that was flying no you know, no that's nah, absurd i I'm love out that theory that. though i love that it's, theory. it's fun for what it is but i'm i'm out i'm out I'm yeah out. it's absolutely not not pot and i don't think edard's coming back to life or anything but who right. knows maybe maybe um maybe there's a chance Helen reed took and buried his bones on the isle of faces yeah yeah Helen reed God. the biggest question mark in the entire series I, I, absolutely he's either going to be the most massive player or he's going to be like one of those kind of like Benjen was in the show where you see him and it gives yeah. you a little thing, but it's like, it's like the real, like you, sometimes you have those people in the story. So it's this whole big deal. And then they show up kind of like, um, like when Sirius black shows up in Harry Potter, like to mm-hmm. like fight and then he gets killed, you know what I mean? Like, and it's just like, Oh, you know, he's only there for like a little bit and he fights, you know, against what's her name? Lestrange and gets, you know, gets killed. And it's such, it's like, you know, it's like, Oh, this like a uh, moment, you know, it's like, like that might be Helen Reed. Like Helen Reed shows up, does something awesome, gives us just enough information to go on, but then gets killed. I can see that happening with his character. And in the books, we don't know if Helen Reed was with Eddard at the Tower of Joy. We do. No, we do. Save for Helen Reed. Helen Reed, we know that we know that Ned makes it out of there because of Helen Reed, but we don't know what he did. Okay. So this also is a little bit strange, right? Because there's always a the question of how did Ned and Helen Reed beat up the King's guard, right? Like, how did they do this thing? And right. It, but see the int- yeah. See, but the interesting thing is, is in the show, obviously, we see this thing where Helen just like sort of like comes up behind and stabs the back. The other thing about that though is, I mean, Ned Stark does go with her. There was sort of like a group of guys, but it's not just Arthur Dane. Like that's the thing I think people forget. Is it's not just like oh I mean it's Arthur Dane and two other Kingsguard members. Yes, and like, specifically, not, yeah, by like the way, Gerald specific- Hightower is a, a boss too. Yes, and Helen specifically, spe- uh, sorry, specifically, <laughs> Ned told Bran that Helen had saved his life from Sir Arthur Dane. Mm-hmm. Now, how would Helen Reed save his life if he got beat up by three squires? Now, exactly, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's this- the whole that's and that's why i don't think he was the i i don't think because it's like he lives in the neck like how is somebody who how is somebody who lives in the neck which is the swamps going to ride a horse and like i mean jousting it's not it's not an easy thing to do so i think that's why it's obvious it's liana i do there are people who make an argument that it could be like brandon stark and we it's like we yeah, it's just you know. not. I don't know if it really does much for the story if it is right. Yeah. So actually, like, the the I pulled it up here. The um the the Cantus post that I that we'll we'll do like a big Patreon that we you and I talked about this like what we want to do for Patreon next year, uh and doing like a big like Heron Hall, uh thing, um he argues that actually he's like, we will probably never know. And that's not really the important, like who the night of laughing tree thing. Isn't the important part. Cause his whole deal is he argues that there's actually 
going into Heron Hall, you know, all these like there, it's not like there's the political thing of Rhaegar sends everyone because he wants to say, hey, I want to overthrow my dad. And that there was actually his whole belief is that there was actually already another sort of alliance being formed um, that was ready to overthrow all of the Targaryens of like mm -hmm. Robert Baratheon and Ned, like in the Starks and um, the Aaron. So basically because once they get kidnapped, it's like they march to war pretty fast. And so it feels like he, what he, he sort of argues that some of those pieces were already moving and that it's actually when Rhaegar meets Lyanna, it's not so much that, oh, he meets her and like falls in love with her. It's that he meets her and she sort of tells him some of the details that, oh, hey, actually there's this like other group of people. And maybe if you can persuade them to your side, then yeah. Yeah, so like, so it's more of like the political side of the story. And anyway, we, we will do we'll do that. I think maybe in like January we'll do like the big we'll start a big mega breakdown of of Heron Hall and everything with some of this stuff in it too. Um, yeah, dude. Like, here's the thing about Helen Reed that's interesting, right? Is that he went and fought at the Tower of Joy, which means that if he was the person that kind of led to the meeting of Lyanna and Rhaegar, right? if he did that, then he would have had believed that Rhaegar did kidnap Lyanna because he was fighting for that cause. Right. So, mm -hmm. and, but then he would have saw that Lyanna gave birth to John. So he's one. Of well, the see, the and that knows that. Yes. And that's, and that's what, that's where the big theory of, which I don't know that I'm hundred percent in on, but I, if it turns out to be true, I think, cause I don't think that like N plus a equals J, which is like Ned plus Ashara. No, I'm out on that. I do think the the second most likely thing is that Mira is is um, John's twin. Yeah, that I think one, I, that's a pretty interesting theory because that to me allows for a bunch of other theories to exist. So I'm not saying like I like it's not my 100 percent go to, but it's like second. Like I I think that's likely because. Then it would set up a scenario in which John or which um, Howland and Ned get down there because I don't think they even fight. I think they get down there. They tell him, hey, Rhaegar's dead. Here's what's going on. They hear a baby cry. And I think like save for Howland is Howland like calms the situation down. And we create the thing in which Arthur Dane like goes to the wall and everybody goes up there and... It's like a whole big, whole big other deal. Because to me, the whole fact that Rhaegar would leave Arthur Dane, like you could send, I don't know, you could send Barrison Selmy down there. You could send, uh, I know Barrison has his own stuff, which, um, you know, because he sort of kind of loved Ashara and some of these other things too. Yeah. Um, But I just don't see, I just, it's still just so shocking to me that he sends Arthur Dane to protect, you know, liana yeah. at the tower yeah. joy which with john and doesn't have him on the field of battle where he's going one on like he's gonna go one-on-one -on -one with robert brathian well you have thing. to remember so two things one Rhaegar thinks that this child is the most important thing in the world it is literally the f prophecy fulfilled we think and <laughs> right. Rhaegar's delusional Rhaegar's yep. delusional thing he could be robbie brathian one-on-one and in any other fantasy story, Rhaegar would have won because that's Prince Charming. But instead, he was destroyed by a Warhammer in the belligerent, big chested brute wins, right? Conan wins. So I think that should tell us how important Rhaegar felt this birth was, is that he sent literally the best to guard it, right? So I think that that shows that Rhaegar probably valued this kid's life over his own. Because he, because the song of ice and fire prophecy the song that we're seeing in House of the Dragon play out now, which is so yes. sweet. Well, and another thing, folks, listen. I know that we got the parentage reveal in the show, and I know a lot of the listeners are are show watchers. This is why the books are more interesting because that that scene is not just going to be John find like we find out that it's John. We know this. There are so many other things that have to happen at the Tower of Joy. Arthur Dane's demise or escape. Ned and Ashara and that relationship. And why is he, mm -hmm. ta he takes the sword back and then they name a kid after him. Yeah, I know. Like, and see, that's, that's why I believe Arthur Dane's still alive. Is because, be. because I just don't see a scenario in which 
And that that's the other thing about Mira too. Like that, it's what almost makes me. And maybe it's because we're in a Mira chapter where it almost makes me believe that Mira is John's is John's twin because then it, it gives it gives us a reason why Howland Reed would never leave the neck in a time of peace, right? Because if he comes and he brings his daughter, and people are like, "Wow, Mira and John kind of look alike," and people might start putting the pieces together. Right. Because mm. I mean, like, you know, even as readers, we're like, no, hold on a second. I mean, this is, you know, the first time I figured out R plus L equals J before I realized it was the biggest theory in the world, you know, because I was just reading it and not putting the pieces together. Because that's what drove me in, really. When I watched the first few episodes, I was like, well, I got to figure out who like Jon Snow's mom is. This is like the whole deal. Right. I was like, this has to be like the whole key to the whole story. Right. And I started thinking about it. I was like, hold on a second here. How is it that Ned Stark? the most loyal dude ever like slips up with some random barmaid comes and it, and hold on, he gets back and it would take all this time. And the, like, you have to have nine months to have a baby. So he would have had to have had a kid then go picks the, you know what I mean? He goes to the, like you start doing the math and you're like, none of this adds up. So the fact that Howland Reed would never leave the neck in times of peace, which like people can't even find the thing. Right. I mean, it's almost like it's almost like clicking your garage door closed. Once it's closed, people, you know, people aren't going to get in, man. It's like it, nobody knows how to get there. Like they can't drive horses and stuff in. So it's like you could pretty freely leave and go north if you wanted to go see your old friend. But I it could be because if he shows up with his kid and people are like, wow, Mira's kind of the same age as John and she kind of looks like him. And hold on a second. Didn't Ned and Howland like hang out a bunch when they were riding in the, the nine month? And they start doing the math. And I might be like, wow, it's because they're like twins. Yeah. The only thing I, I think would be tough is that we know that Liana's last words are Ned promise me. Ned promise me. Not Ned and Howland promise me. Right. So I, I, I well, I kind of that's I, because that's because she might just be talking to her. That's just because she might just be talking to her brother. Yeah, and they said that Howan is the one that removed his uh, Ed and Liana's hands, right? Whenever he's holding her hand while she dies. But is that, where is that at? It's in the it's in the book. It basically, oh, yeah. it it's like uh, Edard found Liana and was with his sister when she died. Howan was among those who found Ned still holding Liana, silent with grief. Oh, remember was yes, the person yes. who took Liana's hand from Edard's. Yeah. So. My only thing is, is like if if we're going to say it's Ned's bastards, like having a twin is worse than having one. Right. Like you would just say I, I had bastards like together and then they could still grow up together. Like, I don't know what the point yeah. of separating them would be, I guess. Um, now, what I will tell you is that it is very interesting. Very interesting that that Mira looks like John is described very similarly to John. You want to hear some crackpot theory? You ready? Yeah. What what if what if Howland Reed and Liana had at some point? <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole the whole deal is her age. I'm saying he's a spearman. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. The whole deal the whole deal is her age. And the fact that we never hear anything about her mother. Like that's the other thing that's sort of interesting. Yeah, where do these and kids it, pop out from? Right. And again it's also we, this is where we might be a little more influenced by the show mm -hmm. right because show mirror looks an awful lot like show john uh, oh no <laughs> you know what i mean like maybe the books it's not as you know it's it's certainly it might not be like as different but show mirror i mean her hair dude i mean the, I'm, is that the same hairstylist do it i mean <laughs> i know they it's have different kid harrington of, it's actually Dude, Harry. I mean look, I mean look at them though. I mean seriously, it they I mean <laughs> they look like they could be brother and sister. So I I put the Mira is John's twin into the same bucket that I put Cersei and Jamie are Targaryens where it's like, well, there's enough there to where like you could say this is a possibility, but most likely I, I think it's I think it's a step above that because like Cersei and Jamie being Targaryens really only does like it doesn't it's like small level stuff like it doesn't impact the story whereas like this is like big this could be a big deal well it it, it does so the Cersei and Jamie thing it definitely helps the story in the sense that it's another slight to Tywin that his only real child would have been Tyrion in the first place mm -hmm. 
So th- that that would have been interesting, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, uh, like I don't believe that theory, but it, I do like thinking about that theory. I think it, the timeline, unfortunately, does not match. So right. Uh, the Elston, only other, yeah. I was gonna say also it kind of makes a commentary on Aries and how absolutely insane he was, and he, the fact that he was cuckolding Tywin for a while. Right. Pretty well. The I guess the other the other thing is that I know it's not as weird when you're talking about like Targaryens or whatever doing it is that Mira might legitimately end up being like, I mean, <laughs> Mira might end up being as crazy as a sense. She might end up queen. You think? Well, you think? I mean the show, they just brands just like, we'll see you later in the books. I don't think that's going to oh, well, happen. Yeah. That's not going to happen in the books, but like, well, I-, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying though, is like when, when Mira has that scene in the show, which I do think, I don't know. I I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay. I mean, she may end up being queen because if Bran becomes king, right. I, Bran th- King, yeah, he might okay. get married to her. Like, sir, I mean, legitimately, that that she might end up. That's that's you know something that you, that's like theory you never really think about. But Mira Reed at the end of this whole thing might end up as queen of Westeros. I kind of love it. <laughs> I'm not I don't lie. think I don't think people. <laughs> I, I've never seen somebody th- theorize that before. But it kind of, I mean, logically, I, it could be, it could be the case. Mira as Reed, Mira Reed might be queen of Westeros at, at the end on the last page. And Helen reads the hand. Let's go. <laughs> Helen Reed would be a terrible hand. He doesn't understand any politics. He literally lives in a swamp. It's like, it's yeah. like going down to like backwater. Louisiana. Queen, queen, queen Mira Reed. Might Stark might might be sit the if Bran dies she could sit the Iron Throne. <laughs> I I <laughs> I mean, just saying you don't know, man. I do like that though. I mean, I I think Mira definitely has a bigger p- part to play in the story post uh, North stuff. Uh, how Helen re reenters the story is beyond me, but I know that he's going to. Helen Reed yeah. will matter in the story. Um, part of me wonders if he could help out with the battle of the bastards, but I don't, he's not a, here comes the Calvary guy because he doesn't have a Calvary. No. So it, it's going to have to be in some like very covert way. Yeah. So the, the interesting, I, for me, when Howland reemerges, it's going to have to be a scenario Ooh. in which, in which. I guess I guess the question is how is the information about Jon Snow's parentage going to be revealed? In the show, they did it with Bran and a vision seeing the Tower of Joy. We might not actually get that in the books. I've often said that I think cuz then you know like like some it's also sort of revealed to Sam like when he reads it and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um I kind of think that that's going to be the case is that it's actually going to be John Connington who sort of maybe reveals it or reveals like a piece of it to the reader in which it's John Connington at the Citadel instead of Jorah Mormont, like we got in the show, getting his grayscale removed by Sam. Hey, what's going on here? We get some of these pieces. Oh, you know what, John, like Snow, we might, you know, get some of those things because John Connington might put the pieces together and he actually might know that Mm -hmm. Jon Snow is actually, hold on a second here, you know, like I knew Lyanna was pregnant, you know, Ned Stark. Uh, And by the way, Connington would switch on young Griff so fast. Oh yeah. (laughs) It it would would be immediate. Well, that's only if he doesn't think he's legit, which I think he does. Right. Right. Cause that would technically be Rhaegar's first kid. Connington is hundred percent under the idea that Griff is real. Right. So he may find out that he's not, and then, or he may reveal that, oh, Rhaegar actually had another. Like, maybe that's what it'll be, is like, it's one of those, like, end of the page type of a things in which, like, we get that scene of Sam removing the grayscale. And it's like, well, Rhaegar actually may have had another. And, like, that's just the end of it. And then it's fully revealed by either, like, Howland Reed or something. Because, because. I guess I, we don't need the brand tower of joy scene. Like that's great for TV because you get the shot of like the baby's eye and then yeah, it cuts to yeah. John and like King of the North. Like, it's just one of those things that comes across better on screen. Amazing. My favorite part of the entire freaking series, 
Plus, then we get the King of the North, Jon Snow scene. Which I would say King fun. of the North is your favorite. Yeah, I can I can quote it. It's so good. I listen. I literally <laughs> listen. The theme song that's going on in the background is on my playlist. I listen to it while I'm splitting wood all the time. It's so. <laughs> good. Um, but uh, it's great for bench pressing too. You just like ah oh, yeah, just be, you know it's great. I love it. Um, anyway, so because Howland Reed in the in the show was never really like explained a bunch. Mm-hmm. In the books, he's he's obviously way more important. He knows much more. And we've been told that stories have to, are going to be told another time. And unlike Star Wars, I think those stories will actually be told. Of course, that's if George can finish the stories. Yeah, of course. Uh, here's one way that we could get Helen Reed into the story. What if after all this Brienne stuff is kind of resolved, Lady Stoneheart goes up to the Isle of Faces to go after one of the Bannermen that wasn't the, like Ned's best friend other than Robert Baratheon, who was not there for him? What if Lady Stoneheart heads north and looking for the bones, right? The bones went missing. Catelyn knows the bones went missing. She's Lady Stoneheart. She's yeah. out for vengeance. She might say, before I rest, well, she's not going to say anything, but you know, before she rests, she has to find these bones, and that's what takes her to Hall and Reed. You know, actually, that that's a very good idea, because yeah, I've, I've often thought of what's going to be the demise of Lady Stoneheart, um, and I've often thought it would be like she sees Arya, and mm-hmm. like Arya comes back over kind of like she does in the show. And because she, she is, she's going to come over. But the question about when Arya comes back over is like, what's the state of everything going to be? Because, you know, Sans is in such a different spot. Um, I do. I do think it'd be So I kind of thought that she would end up running into Catelyn Stark, Lady Stoneheart. And it would almost be like kind of like a ghost that like, oh, now my purpose is fulfilled. And she sees her daughter is safe. But then Arya is also Arya is also going to see it. What if Arya has to like kill her? I mean, she's going to give her mercy. Yeah, it could. It could be a mercy killing, uh, especially since Arya's chapter in Winds of Winter is called Mercy, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, this is not going to happen, so you guys can just ignore me. But wouldn't it be interesting, considering that Barrick gave her life, if somehow she's the one that gives John back his life? Because yeah. the arc of her and John had exactly. been so, With- you know, such a tumultuous relationship. And yeah. for her, that would be like a really nice arc for her. Um, yeah, because there are moments where she talks about Jon Snow. Well, especially because Jon is the last Stark alive. Maybe she, maybe right. she, fe- you know, but you would have to get her north of the wall wins a winner. Right. It ain't happening. I it's would. Happening. Well, I don't know. Um, I would love the I, I would I would love the idea of her. um, Of her realizing that actually Ned Stark never betrayed her. It would be nice. I don't know if we'll it would get be nice in Game of Thrones, but I, I, I mean, I would love it. Yeah, it's like I just it's, don't know how you get just, her up there, though. It's just hard. It, well, I don't think she needs to just go north of the wall. I mean, she could show up to a potential battle of the bastards. It all depends on when John gets resurrected. Well, like yes. if John, John might not get resurrected until the end of. So we might not even. I've talked about that too. There may be no battle of the bastards. Man, that'd be wild, wouldn't it? There could be other battles. Like it could just be, it could just be Sansa takes the Knights of the Veil, vale and and once Bolton realizes that that's not the actual Arya Stark, and like you know, Theon may cause some more mischief up there too. And mm-hmm. once Stan, once Stannis is kind of, once Stannis is kind of pushed down, it may end up. It may actually, you know what? It could actually be flipped around. What if it's? It could be. Sansa takes the Knights of the Vale up there, and it's John that brings his new wildling armory now that he's no longer tied to the Night's Watch down and saves her. Because she may say, I want to take, she may take her army with young Griff potentially up there. Jesus. There's so much way to consider, though, because remember, Princess Shireen has to burn. George yeah. gave them that point. So, like, how do we get back up there to do that? I think that, I think we're pretty, I think you're pretty much already there because I think that. Um, I think it's, you know, we're going to, we know we're going to start with the battle of like winter, right. Which is going to be Stannis and everything, but some people think Stannis might not lose. I don't know. I, I, Stannis is, Stannis is, Stannis to me, if of is the single hardest and maybe, I don't know, maybe George is already, he's, he's just already decided. But for me, if I were trying to finish the story, which I am by the way, not qualified to do, I'm, I just want to get to this point out here. Okay. 
Jimmy and I love a song of ice and fire. Okay. And we speculate it on speculate about it all the time. But sometimes I see other Game of Thrones content creators saying that like, oh, like George should just hire me to help finish. No, stop. Okay. None of us are qualified enough to assist George. He's like, he's a genius level writer. So sometimes I just throw out, we throw out speculations of things we think, but like, I could not for the life of me figure out how to, how, how, how to go about in like the best possible narrative way, finishing Stannis's point, which to me, I think would be the hardest part. Like if I had, if I were writing these books to finish, that's the hardest part to finish. Cause you have to get past it to get anything else going. Yeah. And it removes another player from like the actual game of thrones. Right. Um, right. Part of me feels like it is going to have to revolve around Brienne because either Brienne is either going to get there and fulfill her oath of killing Stannis with oath keeper, which would be cool. Or she's going to fall short. Like she did in the show. They had a deleted scene with her staring at Stannis's dead body, blah, 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 blah. I, I do feel like, they have to be in the same vicinity when he dies, but maybe not. Maybe George just lets it go to the wayside because, you know, she has the oath to go get Sansa and Arya and everything. So it, it, it's up in the air, but I feel like Stannis would be such an interesting character for when the White Walkers do come. You know what I mean? Like, I know. I know a lot of people think you're on. I mean, we don't really know about the end game with the White Walkers and stuff like that, but I do kind of like the idea of like Stannis getting taken over and being because the whole deal was he was light bringer now he's like this false one and then like mm. john and him do have a relationship so since we don't have an actual like night king like we did in the show you know like a stannis kind of being the one like leading them like melisandre you failed me like going like batshit crazy after he mm -hmm. burns his daughter you know what i mean but the way it kind of happens in the show where he's just like so morally defeated once he realized everything he's done, I think that's most likely what's going to happen. I do. I think that's the most likely scenario for, for Stannis. Yeah. One of the hardest things too, is that we do get a lot of Stannis in the books, but Stannis was like a main POV in the show, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's one of those things where, you know, it depends on Davos is really our, our vehicle and then Melisandre later on. But I, I think, there's got to be some book like Stan book Stannis is one of my favorite characters. Oh, I love it. Stannis the Manus all the way. One true king. But we're going to have to have a POV near Stannis when he dies. Mm. Like we're not getting the Stannis yeah. POV. So is it Melisandre going to be next to him when he dies? Is it going to be Davos? Is Davos going to be the one to kill him? Yeah. Oh, this see. This is the whole deal, man. It's all it's, he is the block. Right, he is the shield that guards the winds of the winter realms from of being end. finished. <laughs> the realms of end, yes, he is it because you you have. You, I'm maybe he's already finished it, and because George says he's never said I, I'm struggling with like Stannis and other people chapters. He's like I'm struggled with Cersei and. Well, I knew we wrote a chapter, handful of uh, Melisandre chapters, which I assume will end up around. Did he Stand mention up. Davos? I thought he mentioned Davos recently. I don't know. Because we I were talking about um, Rickon and stuff like that. Right. Bro, I mean, we, there, there's there's so many things. And we get to these points by talking about an event that happened many, many years ago in the Night of the Laughing Tree Attorney in Heron Hall. So, like, it's just crazy how George has linked these things and all these false narratives, by the way, like the false tale of what happened with Rhaegar and Lyanna, the false tale of the Night of the Laughing Tree, like. I see why it's so hard to wrap up. I get it. Yeah. Crazy. It's, it's crazy. So I think that's, I think that's an, that's an okay spot. Cause this is what happens sometimes. So we just get to the point where it's like, well, I, I'm I don't know. It's, it's, it's what happens every time. So, ah, uh, it's why I love, why I love diving into it. So next week's by the way, is actually going to be a, well, next week we might, uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at this outline. There's a good amount to talk about. I mean, we could probably so do we a might... chapter as well, but we'll see okay so we'll see so certainly next time we're going to be diving into the now newly leaked outline of a feast for crows um so we will certainly do that but our our next chapter and again if you guys want to read ahead um and send us your thoughts and like a raven and we do have some ravens piled up that we want to uh we do that too so december might be kind of an odd month um just because like the holidays and everything so we'll just i know other people are taking listeners are taking holidays and stuff like that as well so 
But certainly go ahead and send us those ravens and we can, uh, if you want to share your thoughts on the chapter we'll be reading next time, which is Davos 3. And if you like our podcast, don't forget to subscribe, like us, write a review, leave a comment, or send us a raven at btkcast at gmail.com or bendtheneepodcast.com. We'll see you next time. And remember that winter is coming.